Well, good morning, everybody. Woman Jika, it's fantastic to have you back at the Capitol. I love performing, so I built myself a theatre. It's not a bad, bad way to go, really. So, uh, and it's, this is my first performance since the opening, so you can all rate me afterwards in the, uh, in the evaluations. I will warn you, you have a highly caffeinated bean this morning, so I'll be uh, whipping through the presentation fairly quickly as we go. Julie, thanks so much for that wonderful acknowledgement of country that you did for us as we began, and I just want to join you in just thanking the people of the Woomarung and Boonarung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations for welcoming us to their land uh, and, uh, and to all the places where RMIT does our business across Australia and our islands. I want to thank their ancestors, elders past and present, and of course, emerging leaders for all that they do to celebrate the great richness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. So Jason, thank you very much. Jason and I are on a, on a journey of disruption together and we deliberately didn't compare our notes today, um, but you'll see there's just some wonderful commonalities and overlaps as we, we go through. Uh, I'm obviously uh, from RMIT and I'm talking about shift. I used to say shift happens and then I got into trouble, so we just talk about it now as shift by RMIT. And you know, Jason gave us a bit of a sense as to all of the drivers of change that are disrupting the world of working in our communities. And if you're sort of a Radio National listener, as I am on the way into work this morning, it was, you know, there was an amazing discourse just about the, the impact that artificial intelligence is having uh, on us. And when I returned to Australia after 30 years, uh, about five years ago, you never would have heard that discussed uh, on the radio. And it just reinforces for Jason how quickly everything is changing. But you know what? I think the, the mother of all changes was the internet the great disruptor of our time. And I was really proud of the fact that I was there when it was born. I'm pretty sad that we didn't think through some of the downsides. We only wanted to think about the upsides, but just look at that growth. From 2000, about 371 million people connected. Today, about 4.3 billion. And as we know, it, um, device after device now are just being tethered to this worldwide um, network. And as you may have seen, it's becoming the new battleground, sadly. Uh, as we seek uh, to sort of establish our way, our way in the world. But I do believe um, it is the great disruptor of our time. Jason talked about this. He actually was a little bit more pessimistic than me. He went up to 65%. I'm sticking with 50% for now of the jobs are at risk in the next, in the next 20 years. But you know what's interesting about that um, is just how it's underpinned by shifts in our economy. And that was talked a little bit about on the radio this morning as well, if you were listening. And it's interesting because Australia has been on a transition from sort of 1988 to 2018. 1988, we were still very much agriculture and manufacturing. Fast forward to today and you'll start to see dominant sectors like healthcare and social assistance starting to predominate in terms of where the big skills gaps are in, in our economy. But as Jason really cleverly pointed out, it's not that agriculture and manufacturing have gone away, but the way we go about agriculture and manufacturing has shifted dramatically, and hence why the skills and the workforce need to shift along with it. But the good news is, for some, is that whilst all of that disruption has been going on, we actually have increased the number of Australians in the workforce. And that's why I, I truly, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature, but I truly believe that as these jobs are displaced, there's two, three or four other jobs that can be created if we as a nation have the courage to work together to understand our comparative advantage, to move from a world where we're largely underpinned by what we dig up and what we grow to a world where we continue to exploit our brains, which is why I'm so incredibly proud of the fact that Australia is one of the top three nations in the world for educating human beings at a tertiary level. And I kind of despair a little bit when the media portrays that as somehow a problem for Australia, that we welcome citizens of the world to be educated in the Australian way by Australians with wonderful institutions like RMIT and others in the sector. This is sort of where we were in 1900. Simple sort of world, one lifetime job. I want you to now think about the fact that today's 15 year olds, and I have one, I might talk about her a little bit during this presentation, her name is Georgie. She's likely to have 17 different employers and five different careers in her lifetime. And what's interesting, and if you, and Jason touched on this as well, because two thirds of jobs 
sorry, Jason, I use soft, I'll replace it with human from now on, will be human skills intensive by 2030. But that makes sense, doesn't it? Because the more the robots, the bots, and artificial intelligence gobble up the jobs that are done today, the more the, the comparative advantage for human beings is going to be able to become innovators. It's going to have to do the creative thinking that the robots just really can't do uh, on their own. I, I am struck by a quote I read back in the 90s, though, by John Nesbitt, who said, the factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog, and the dog will be there to stop the man from touching any of the machinery, uh, <laughs> which I think is quite, quite clever. And this is sort of, according to Burning Glass, they believe that there are 14 skills that have become foundational in the new economy. Human skills, business skills, and digital skills. And Jason touched on that as well. And what's interesting about that taxonomy is that the average advertised salary of jobs requesting at least one of these new foundational skills was greater than 15% the average of other jobs. And when it comes to the ability for, to have mobility and managerial level, those are the things that are being rewarded more and more. And so as Jason said, the ability to learn will be a graduate's most valuable asset in the future world of work. If you take nothing else away from our presentations this morning, for those of you that are parents or have influence over people uh, entering the workforce, or more importantly, for every one of you that is still in the workforce, our ability to learn for life is going to be our most valuable asset. Now, there's, that's because we now have two different systems. We've got my system at the top. I'm not quite a baby boomer. I'm a bit younger than that. But here's my world. I grew up in a world where from zero to five, I got to play. From five to 25, I got to learn. Yep, that's learning behind me. 25 to 65, I got to work. And then 65 plus, I get to play all over again. Pretty simple, quite predictable. We stole all the wealth, we wrecked the planets with superannuation to the max. Um, and we're gonna live happily ever after. And as I tell my kids, give me a couple more years and I'm going skiing, spending my kids' inheritance. <laughs> the new model though looks something like this. Play, school, job, 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 with learning the whole way. That's the new world. And the challenge for universities is how we remain relevant to everybody that needs us in the new world. Because we have to start thinking now, all of us, as knowledge as a currency. You know, we used to think that the old currency looked like this, the diploma. We still give them out, they're still really valuable, it's sort of a rite of passage. We hang them on the wall to make our parents and grandparents feel fantastic. Uh, and in my generation, they were super critical. Because if I could tick that box on the resume, it wasn't that I would get a job, it's just whether I would get the job that I really, really wanted. But today, we have to think about a knowledge portfolio. We have to think about how, we, how do we represent ourselves in LinkedIn or in other portfolios to bring the whole of us to life. Uh, and, and that has to include everything, in my opinion, from pretty well year seven through to the current day. That's how we need to construct our personas as to who we are. And all of that needs to be tuned to be able to be discovered in a world of digital and social media, where if we do that well, we may not get the job, but we dramatically increase the likelihood we'll be discovered and we'll get the interview on the pathway to the job. And I thought what might be interesting was to hear from one of our uh, students about the impact that that thinking had on his career. We live in a competitive age where most people have a basic education and skill set for their given profession. People skills and things like that have never been more important. I was an introvert growing up, so being able to blend in and communicate didn't come easily to me. I spoke multiple languages when I arrived in Australia, and yet I struggled with the dissonance of being lingually capable but not being able to say what I wanted to say. I chose all my microcredits to improve my communication skills. And as a result, I'm now capable of having a constructive conversation with a complete stranger. It's a skill I don't think I would have acquired by conventional means. I got an opportunity to take part in Australia Post Accelerator Program. 
and the interview was demanding of the applicants. I had learned how to move discussions forward, overcome nervousness, to listen and have a constructive conversation, and that was a crucial factor in helping me land that opportunity. These skills are there to be learned, to give us an advantage. At the end of the day, we are in control. It is our responsibility to become the best version of ourselves. I think a pretty interesting story of an individual self-motivated to be able to then develop just a, a ride-along competency to help him be successful in taking that final step into his dream career. Now, what I thought was also interesting, though, was to take a little bit of a look at accelerators into full-time work. I, I spent a lot of time mentoring young people, and I sort of despair when I see sort of parents that are friends of ours or people at the school that I talk to that are sort of rigidly and dogmatically saying, it's all about the grades. It's all about the grades, because it's not. It's not the way the world works now. And when you look at accelerators, enterprise skills, experience, connections, and more and more and more resilience is what employers are looking for. And I had this awesome conversation on Friday night with a wonderful woman where we were talking about our kids and saying, well, how do you really evidence resilience? And you can, here are some of the, the ways. Building enterprise skills and education, so like business creation skills, entrepreneurial skills, doesn't mean you have to start your own business, but it means you know how to innovate, it means you know how to bring ideas to life. That's likely to give you about a 17 month advantage. 5,000 hours of relevant paid employment, it's gonna give you a 12 month head start. Paid employment in a future focused cluster that Jason was talking about, it's gonna give you about a five month head start. And I love this one, an optimistic mindset will get you there two years faster. And I, I think all of them are a proxy for resilience. I think these are the types of ways that you can evidence in your portfolio and who you are that you've sort of had that tenacity to stick with it, to be able to juggle multiple priorities, to be able to do things with people from all sorts of different backgrounds to get ahead in life. And if you think about your own life journey and if you cast your way back, you'll realize how some of those formative experiences for me, that was the first paper run, or getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning and jumping in the front seat uh, with the milkman, getting ready to deliver the milk bottles, drinking a, a half liter carton of Big M chocolate milk, which was my breakfast at the time, and the only thing that got me through. Th those are the days, or, or working the night shift in the Shell service station on the corner of Ferntree Gully and Springvale Road, and I recognize about seven of you from those, those times, by the way. Those, those all made me, they all resulted in me being able to tell a story about Martin Bean that is a story of resilience, of tenacity, of humbleness, all wonderful attributes that the world of work is seeking and needing every single day. Jason put this quote up, it was from EY, 40%, 42% of current and past graduates felt their degree needs to be overhauled. And what did that mean to them? Reshape the sector, prioritize the student, who would have thought? Deconstruct the value chain, unbundle the degree, subscription-based learning, just-in-times options, and innovate with industry, with business. I personally think they've nailed it, and that was a challenge they gave to every Australian university to look at how well they're future-proofing the education, not, not to make money, but to do the right thing by our graduates. Because our mission at RMIT, unashamedly, is to get our students ready for life and work. And that means we have to be prepared to disrupt. Here's the way we think about the world, the world of a disrupted university. You've got a whole plethora of micro-credentials that people can take just in time. Not credit bearing, they're available right now. In fact, through platforms like Coursera and FutureLearn and edX, there's literally thousands of free courses being studied by millions of people all over the world from some of the world's top universities. And then you've sort of got these MISO credentials. They stack and they add up and we start to confer university credit on them so that they can be paid forward. And then they, they collide with the traditional ones, the macro credentials the higher education and vocational education programs, courses, and degrees. But then we get out of university and we get into the world of work. And we realize that a lot of what we've been taught is semi-perishable. Those skills become redundant 
as we move through. I often joke, some of you will remember a thing called DOS. I was a Microsoft DOS wizard. I could do things with DOS that nobody could believe. At a certain point in my life, I had to realize I needed to let my DOS skills go. Uh, and that chuckle says a great deal in this room. So we get into the workforce, but then we've got to start coming back and getting those MISO and micro credentials all over again to top up those semi-perishable skills so that we can remain current, we can remain vibrant, and we can live the lives that we and our families want. And I'd like to think, with the help of some amazing people in this room uh, and, and a bunch of great thinking in helping us inform that RMIT is leading the way. And I thought I'd just talk a little bit how we're doing it. But before I do that, though, to the RMIT people in the room and perhaps to our students in industry, I want you to remind you, I want to just remind you, though, that this isn't a new population for RMIT. 42% of our students are already over the age of 24. And as Daryl knows, that statistic hasn't changed much over the five years that we've been working together. We've always been, from 1887 as the Working Man's College, We've always been an institution that has thought about helping people, irrespective of their age or background. If you need education to get ahead, you come to RMIT. That's what we do. So we, we set about to launch creds, micro-credentials for all of our undergraduate students. Uh, and the whole idea is that you can choose what you want to do. As Jason said, it allows you to append skills and competencies to what you're studying. We'll give you a digital badge to put in your LinkedIn profile or Seek or wherever you choose to do it, and also on your transcript so that your employer is not just looking at your grades, they're looking at the creds as well. Uh, and you'll be able to share those in whatever social network you're in, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you are. Those are transportable digital badges that are being fine-tuned to with semantic connections to the web crawlers so that you will be discovered. According to LinkedIn in a study they did about three years ago, in an area of skills shortage, somebody with a relevant micro-credential is searched for 11 more times than somebody with a bachelor's degree in the same area. Somebody with a bachelor's degree and the micro-credential, I can assure you something pretty remarkable happens in your ability to be found by those who need you. Uh, and the success has been overwhelming. In two years, without any credit, we've had 37,000 students uh, flocked to them. Um, and we've embedded now 43,000, and we then embedded them in degree structures. We've had 43,000 students take them. But the stat I'm really loving is that students enrolling in more than one, voluntarily, 64%, and they're claiming their badges at a rate of 94%. For the students in the room, I am so proud of you for recognizing that these are the things that are going to give you that leg up when you choose to step into the labor market and it's also you getting on a journey of discovery for life. But we didn't stop there. Um, we also created RMIT Online because we knew we needed a way to help our alumni and working adults come back and get those semi-perishable skills. So in just two years, we've had 3,300 enrollments in our short courses. We've got 26 future skills courses in market today in 2019. We have 50 partnerships that we've formed with uh, leading technology and other organizations. Uh, and the average weekly sessions of people coming to our website uh, is up to 32,000 per week this year versus just 4,000 in February last year. Put it another way, these things are on fire. And why are they on fire? It's because when you bring a great institution with wonderful teaching capability together to help meet skills shortages in our communities and in the, the, um, the jobs that we partake, then some pretty miraculous things happen. And I'm so proud of the partnerships that we've been able to form because they come in all shapes and sizes, whether it's the wonderful ACME, and we're gonna hear about that in a moment, or organizations like ABC Fact Check or, or Adobe or Corrections Victoria Inside Out program or Hands On Health, and the list goes on and on and on. And it's also wonderful technology companies like Udacity, where we've launched our first self-driving car course uh, but we're also introducing courses in AI programming, Python, robotics, software engineering, front-end web developer, a lot of the ones that Jason just had up on the screen as we talked about before, or whether it's with Amazon Web Services, 
where we've launched some amazing programs in AI and VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality. And when we launched with them, since the launch just last year, we've had over 108 million uh, marketing impressions talking about and discussing those courses. Uh, and, and that was a world first for RMIT and Amazon. We were the first institution anywhere in the world to launch with them in their Sumerian AR and VR programming language. And so I thought it'd be nice just to uh, share a couple of quotes with you before I wrap up. This is from Andrew Coe, who's the Managing Director of Global Education at Amazon Web Services. RMIT's approach to contemporary education and creating a next generation workforce to support the jobs of tomorrow is truly world leading. We look forward to continue to innovate with RMIT across educational reform and digital student experience in Australia and the global market. Amara's Law. We tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate it in the long run. Ladies and gentlemen, to Australia's peril, will we underestimate the disruption that is going on around us but together we can create an unbelievable future for our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you.